Let's talk about Southeast Asia today. I'm bringing back Professor Jean here, straightforward and easy to understand political commentator. But after listening to what he has to say, I want to dive a bit deeper into a few details. Let's go. The US-China competition is going to be a long-term competition. And one shouldn't expect immediate outcome. It consists of domestic competition, in which both countries will try to improve the competitiveness of their domestic economy and efficiency of governance. It also consists of competition in foreign relationships. Both countries will try to win favors over other countries during this process. To me, the highlight of this competition will occur in Southeast Asia. The American specialty is try to create conflict and tension around China, create unrest and stir up trouble, motivating, for example, Philippines and India to escalate tension with China. Also, U.S. will use many NGO to stir up color revolution in the area, including Southeast Asia, South Asia and Central Asia. Even if those NGO did not succeed in overthrowing government, it can still create disturbance and interrupt China's rise. This is US favorite geopolitical strategy. In addition, this new 1.6 billion Congress bill passed to support media demonization of China, what I will call dog food for the social media, is well known tactic that has been used continuously towards its geopolitical rivalries. It's all part of the grand competition and we are used to it. The Chinese government cares a lot about Southeast Asia. We often use the phase that we want to establish the community of shared future with Southeast Asian countries. The economic relationship with Southeast Asia in recent years is pretty good. Political relationship is also very healthy, aside from the Philippines. Almost all Southeast Asian countries were originally colonies of the West. So the cultural historical influence of Western powers over the region is still existing today. There was an organization called Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, CENTO, founded back in 1954. The primary goal was to prevent the spread of communism during the Cold War. You can also see it as part of an anti-China coalition led by the United States. So the United States has some advantage over the Southeast Asian countries, at least due to recent history, because in recent history, China is too weak to project any power. Of course, I believe China's influence is catching up to the US in the region. To begin with, we are their neighbors. The United States is far away. Secondly, our economic tie with the region is much stronger than the US. Finally, I think majority of Southeast Asian countries agree with the Chinese style of non-intervention of its foreign policy. In recent months, research and poll conducted by organizations in Singapore and Australia shown that China's influence over the region is improving and has surpassed the United States in some countries. The Foreign Affairs magazine of the U.S. also expressed concern that the U.S. is losing its influence over the region. From my point of view, I believe the current situation is a deadlock, 50-50. It's hard to say who is really leading in the region, China or U.S. Again, the polls are sometimes deceiving. It might not show an accurate picture of what's really going on. And it can change pretty quickly due to ongoing events. Of course, I believe China is going to overtake the US in the coming future regarding influence over the Southeast Asian countries. I believe this is a trend difficult to reverse. China has a huge and expanding industrial sector. And industrial sector often carry this spoil over effect. Many Southeast Asian countries need industry to boost their growth and China will be their biggest investor. 
Southeast Asian countries also need infrastructure development. Which country can offer them the infrastructure they need it? Of course, China. And of course, China's financial capability are also well above that of the Western counterpart when it comes to foreign investments. I still see that the U.S. is the sole superpower on this planet, but what we are witnessing is that many regional powers are on the rise. In fact, I find it funny that majority of the Chinese scholars today consider the U.S. still to be the sole superpower, but many of my foreign colleagues disagree with me. When I traveled to Africa recently, many people there told me, "No, there's two superpower right now in the world: China and the U.S." But I will express that within Chinese intellectual community, we do not see China as a superpower yet. However, that being said, I believe when it comes to Asia or Southeast Asia in particular, we are entering a bipolar world. Or to be accurate, bipolar with other strong regional power as well, because if I say only bipolar, our friends in India will not be happy with that description. I used to travel to Southeast Asia countries very often: Malaysia, Singapore. That was ten years ago, so I don't have any more. On the ground experience、uh, during the past decade, what I do want to talk about is this public perception of a country, and I want to use Southeast Asia here as an example. Okay, let's see if you guys get what I mean. So when I ask my audience anywhere around the world, okay, whether you like a country or not, or to be more exact, do you love a country or do you hate a country? Can that person really? Dissect his or her own feeling, opinion towards a country. Okay, when you say you dislike a country,、um, or its people, or both, a mixture of both, it's usually a combination of the three following things. Okay, that country has violated you, or your people, or your land in the past.、Uh, for example, Germany invasion of Poland,、uh, Soviet oppression of Eastern Europe. U.S. military action towards the Middle East and Japanese invasion of China. So those are traceable historical facts, right? Now, number two, an ongoing event: the current Russia-Ukrainian war, the conflict in Gaza, now is spreading to Lebanon. So those are also things that will affect your perception, your feeling towards a certain country. And number three, I will say, is propaganda inference. So. When you see or feel about a certain country, how you like it or not, it's usually a combination of these three judging factors, right? Now, I was watching one of the Chinese broadcasts in Guangdian several months ago, in which the host, Mr. Tang, described a very interesting phenomenon. He said that in the current information digital world, okay, a person's perspective. Is feeling towards its neighbor or other countries in other region, or sometimes even towards its own country, is shaped mainly by the information you receive from the internet, right? News, social media, and so on. And since public audience have a finite amount of time to receive information, the more airtime an event gets, the more attention you will get, correct? And since the Global information space is currently dominated by Western media outlet. What those outlet chose to expose or chose to conceal will have direct impact on the progression and cause of those events. Judging by whether it's a war or some other、uh, geopolitical tensions and other events, let me use two example here. Okay, the conflict in Gaza. The initial event in October seventh led to you know twelve hundred people killed. Very tragic. However, I remember the news that came out initially、uh, was very well executed. The story, the scenes captured by the news camera, it really brought out the cruelty of the Hamas attackers. Right? It's almost like a Hollywood movie. But then Mr. Tang said, if you look at how Well, that event was presented. 
in comparison to how well, let's say, the previous events of Israeli aggression towards Palestinians in Gaza and in the West Bank, it shows a huge contrast. And many Chinese geopolitical analysts uh, conclude that the main reason of, let's say, here, TikTok getting banned, and also Telegram is getting into trouble as well, is because those are the two platforms that are considered loopholes, a challenge to Western dominated entities to control its narrative. So my audience, okay, if you can picture a world map, okay, I'm going to put up here and imagine there's many volume bars, okay, that's a certain powerful media oligarchy class who has huge influence over the media space, has control over the volume knob. And through that, control what kind of news and information you get. So imagine, for example, the problem between Israelis and Palestinians during the normal time when things are going on, when Israelis continue to move into Palestinian settled region during those times, the volume bar is turned to low or zero. Like, there's nothing going on. <laughs> it's mostly peaceful time in decades, according to, you know, Jay Sullivan, I think. You know, go watch your football game. There's this Man United versus Liverpool in which Liverpool destroyed it, the Red Devil 7-0. And Sir Alex Ferguson almost had a heart attack watching this life inside the stadium that day. Or if you don't like football, you are not interested. Okay, that's fine. Go watch uh, the what is it? The royalty drama ongoing uh, regarding Prince Henry and his wife Meghan. Nothing going on in the Middle East. Absolutely nothing. And then bang! When the October seven event happened, the volume knot was suddenly turned to maximum. Which okay, it makes sense. It is a big event because 1,200 people die, and that's not including the Hamas attackers that die as well. And then when the ground operation started and the whacking ball was unleashed, TikTok was starting to report on the horrifying things that was happening to the civilian in Gaza. And the media czar <laughs> found out, wait a second, I don't have control of that particular volume knob, the TikTok. Because I think the original plan was to portray the Gaza conflict like almost a Iraq invasion, right? All glorified justice. The civilians that were dying was irrelevant because there's no TikTok or Telegram back then to report on them. So when the so-called free media started to catch up with those so-called US war crimes, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the war has ended for years. The goose was already cooked and eaten, so it doesn't matter anymore. So I think in order for a normal person, a person who's becoming more aware of geopolitical events around the world, it is often good to remind yourself, including me, by the way, of this map I'm going to show you again here. And on that map, there's perhaps hundreds, if not thousands of volume bars, okay? And the bars are just in a way favoring the ruling elites. They're telling you or us where to look and where not to look. I think for a person to advance himself from, let's say, as a casual geopolitical observer to a more seasoned geopolitical expert, if you want to call it that yourself, you need to understand what you are looking at on your screen right now. That it is a layer of smoke curtain to channel your attention to a location the controller sees fit. And this is used not just to individuals, but also intensively to a country's political decision body. This happened domestically in the US and of course internationally in foreign policy. Let me give you guys uh, an example outside of China and US, okay? When China was negotiating with Turkey a few months ago regarding some business deals, Erdogan increased the tariff of Chinese EV cars to Turkey 
right before the negotiation. So this is a move, what we Chinese call creating a business leverage. Okay. What Edwin did was he wanted something in that business deal uh, to get the Chinese to agree to a certain price, for example, for a project. But he knew the Chinese won't accept out of generosity. So he used political power to create the leverage to increase the EV tariff to say that, hey, <laughs> if you agree to my price, then I will remove the EV tariff, which he did at the end. So this is a common practice in international relationship. Another example, and I need to be a little bit careful here, is in order to get a country to agree to a certain, let's say, um, security agreement, certain country will do what I will call intentionally manufacture an incident, a terrorist attack, for example, or something in order to help that country's governing legislation to pass a certain bill which they hesitated before, okay? This strategy works mainly towards democratic countries to convince and swing public opinion. Doesn't work that well against countries like Russia and China. I think there are many countries in Eastern Europe who accept or about to accept something like 10% of its GDP spent on defense which I assume a huge portion of that money will be going to the United States, MIC. Let me tell you guys a real joke, okay? There was this street in Shenzhen, China. And that street, overnight, the cars that were parked along the street, their tires all got stacked, okay? And just so happened, on their windshield wipers, there's a business car attached to it, <laughs> to them. And it says that contact tire repair shop, 10% discount. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a real event, okay? It's not a, a joke. That's like a Chinese style mafia business, right? But of course, it could be a setup. It could be somebody that just do not like that tire shop and wanna play a joke on them. It's totally possible. But you guys get what I'm referring to. If you study today's US foreign policy in great depth, you can actually find that the US business model is very similar to this kind of, <laughs> you know, I'll call mafia business style, but it is what it is. You know, we're still in the unipolar world. So <laughs> we Chinese are very philosophical and strategical, okay? Uh, we consider buying U.S. bond is like paying tribute to the king. You know, those novels or monocle escorts are not cheap. You need to pay your bills, right? Or else they cannot afford those uh, beautiful ladies. So in the past, whenever U.S. want to financially harvest South Korea or Japan, because those are very productive and rich places, right? US will start to provoke North Korea. And during the provoking process, the volume knob will turn to very low or zero, okay? To cover up the event. And when North Korea took the bait and retaliate, then the media will shine like a spotlight on them. <laughs> and then, the US MIC will be running around and yell, you see how dangerous North Korea is and how aggressive and uncontrollable. <laughs> you need my protection. Now start buying those attack helicopters. I'm about to retire, you know, at five times the price, something like that. So that's definitely not unique to Asia, but basically across the world. And many Chinese see the current Ukrainian war as part of that event as well. <laughs> For example, uh, Australians, right? China is about to invade your mainland. You need to buy those Virginia class nuclear submarine for about what was the price? Two billion dollar a piece. And those are relics. <laughs> and there's no nuclear warhead attached to it. And 
we're not going to deliver them for another two decades or something. <laughs> I have my Australian friends screaming how stupid that was, but <laughs> that's how US conduct business. So we get it. When you look at South China Sea today, it carries many of those tactics and elements as well, uh, creating tensions to try to reduce Chinese reputation in the region, boost on sales, uh, push for more U.S. military base in the region to contain China and diverse attention from other regions such as Israel, you know, don't look at those things that's happening in Gaza, you know, look at South China Sea. <laughs> I, I used to ask this joke in my comment section, like if there's like a media coming towards the planet, maybe U.S. was still saying that, hey, South China Sea is the bigger problem. The world can be destroyed and can be rebuilt, but we cannot have China taking over South China Sea. That's more important. So it's a way to rearrange a person's perspective and priority is what I call it. So if a person truly compare American imperialism uh, in Central America, let's say today even versus, let's say, China imperialism, which there is some, yes, in South China Sea. It, <laughs> you will basically laugh, but most people will not understand what I'm talking about because the volume not in the Central American you know, countries has been turned down to basically nothing and nobody really knows and care about those places. So going back to the competition between US and China in the Southeast Asia today, China is offering Chinese market for Southeast Asian countries uh, for their export. And in return, uh, China is also offering uh, tourism, for example, travel there to spend money on. And overall, these activities uh, boost the standard of living for everyone, right? And China is also offering infrastructure in other investment as well. Okay, what's US offering to Southeast Asia? And they offer something, of course. Uh, U.S. is offering also U.S. market, but U.S. is having a difficult time balance the trade. Mm, so they will use different financial method to balance the trade instead, which in the long run drives up inequality and financial instability. I think some people in Southeast Asia here in my channel knows what I'm trying to talk about. Uh, U.S. also offer protection. Uh, well, why do you need protection? <laughs> because, of course, China. If you don't think China is that bad, we will provoke China to do more bad things until you buy more weapons from us and allow our military base in. So that's basically the point. Allow us to rig your election and regime change your government and then reroute your fiscal policy. So your government will spend less money on social welfare, infrastructure development, for example, because U.S. can provide those, but spend more money on national defense against uh, a, an imaginary enemy. That's what you need to do, right? Anyways, I hope people from Southeast Asia is smart enough to figure all this out. But those George Soros NGO is really professional at what they do. So be very careful. So in order to keep up with the China's influence over the region, U.S. need to continue to demonize uh, China because it has very little to offer to those countries. So basically, I have to play the divide and conquer game to the maximum is what is going to happen in Southeast Asia. And for people around the world who dislike China a lot, I'm glad you find my channel, by the way. Yeah. My American friend is on vacation. I want to show him a good time. Oh, you American? Yeah. Are you ready? You ready? I'm ready. Oh my goodness. This place is off the hook. I want to understand why you dislike China so much, for example. And before you start typing in the comment section about, you know, Uyghurs and South China Sea and human rights, for example, those things, you can use the three factors, okay? I put out here in this video and really ask yourself, do I have a good reason to dislike China? 
or am I just being manipulated to dislike China by the media? And you really have to think about it. And I also I have to also ask myself, am I also being manipulated to dislike US and dislike certain other countries as well? It's a question that um, we constantly have to ask ourselves. And just to be clear, uh, I don't want to sound like a hypocrite here, okay? I love my life here in California. Uh, inflation is a bit tough, but people are friendly. But I won't let my personal preference cloud my geopolitical judgment. I want to, like what I said in the last video, I want to call a, a hyena as a hyena, not a baby giraffe. Uh, there are also many, many problems in China, arguably bigger problems than here in US. But China doesn't export its problem to the world the way US does. It's not capable of, not yet at least. And eventually, I think when the weather is cooling down, I, I would like to take my channel outdoor so I can walk around here on the street in the greater Los Angeles area and show you guys around and talk about geopolitics. It's kind of boring stuck in this room, but the temperature outside is just terrible. In addition, I'm going to start a secondary channel. The reason is that the contents I put in this channel is often a mix of ongoing events and also historical philosophical topics. So it's difficult for YouTube to promote my contents in the right way. And also my audience will get confused as well. Is this a geopolitical channel or is it a news channel or is this a documentary channel? You know, I do all of them. So my audience sometimes get confused and it's difficult for YouTube algorithm to put my videos in the right way. So what I'm going to do is I will keep this channel leaning towards news and ongoing events. And I will try to keep videos short and straightforward, okay? So my audience will get the Chinese perspective on things that's happening around the world. Uh, it's aimed towards a wider group of audience, okay? The secondary channel I'm about to open will be more events, I will say. It will cover topics that are more complicated and on subjects that I personally have difficulty approaching myself. The video will be longer, the pace will be slower, and it's more for audience who really have an open mind and want to dive into more philosophical issues. And yeah, if you have any questions, let me know in the comment section. Richard signing out.